There is no question that something is here. Lurking. Somewhere in the darkened corners. But how will we ever find out what it is? We need to look. Always. And never stop. No matter what stands in our way. No matter what others may think. Explore the darkness. Shine light into it. Join the red strings and the silver threads. Everything is connected. Somehow. I am Mark L. Watson. This is Peer Beyond the Veil. I've been out here in, in Colorado about 22 years, and, and I found it interesting that when I moved out here, I was going through some old school books from elementary school, you know, some stuff that I bought, actually, not school books, but just books I read in elementary, and they were all pertaining to UFOs. So even though uh, I was in elementary school, uh, I had a fascination for it. And then I later found out as I got older that my mom had a sighting in a small town in Arizona called Marenzi. When she was a little girl, she was probably about four or five, and she, from what she describes, she actually describes seeing greys. And then I interviewed my aunt, um, her older sister, uh, a few years back. And she too saw greys, but, but not in the small town of Arizona. They were traveling from Arizona or from California to Arizona. Uh, so it's, I think it's in the family. <laughs> I think it's been in the family for a while. Um, um, all I know is I've always had this fascination for it. Out of the six kids in the, in my family, um, two of us became investigators, myself and then my sister, Debbie, who was on the board of directors for MUFON. And the other four brothers and sisters, they uh, came on a little bit later because I think they were jealous. And my, sis my other sister and I were kind of hanging together. Most nations of the world have their own paranormal hotspots, sites and locations that seem to attract weirdness. Some are prone to repeated hauntings, places where ghosts and spirits and demons frequent. Others are seemingly home to Bigfoots or black cats or dogs. Yet others seem to be highways and byways for the strange things that we see in the skies. In the US, there exist many of the above, but none so seemingly vast as the land which spans the country 37 degrees north of the equator. Known as the 37th Parallel North, or more generally as simply the 37th Parallel, it runs from Chesapeake Bay at the east to Santa Cruz at the west, passing through 12 states on its way. Despite its 2,500 mile span across the country, it's seemingly a hotspot for all manner of strange paranormal and extraterrestrial phenomena, providing a concentration of accounts not known at any other circle of latitude. Natives of the Apache, Navajo, Hopi and Pueblo all tell stories of their people being brought to the earth along the 37th, and all tell of lights, flying objects, glowing in the skies and visiting star people. Thousands of cattle have been mutilated in Kansas and Arkansas since the 70s, and further west in New Mexico, Nevada and Arizona, they're so frequent that most are no longer even reported. In New Mexico, there are tales of giant flying prehistoric birds, walking ape men and chupacabras, portals and vortexes and spirits, and even the deep mystery of the fabled Dulce underground base. At the forefront of the investigations into such things is Chuck Zakowski, chasing down the truth to wherever it may lead. From Skinwalker Ranch to Area 51, and every weird woodlands and cliffside in between, his sceptical yet innovative approach to his research has earned him the position of Deputy Director for Animal Mutilation Research at MUFON, an organisation he's frequently investigated for. His book with Ben Mesrick on the 37th Parallel spent two months on the New York Times bestseller list, but it really only scratches the surface of the reports Chuck has gathered, as a huge swathe of the United States can often peer beyond the veil. The events that happen in the U.S. just don't happen on a 37 degree latitude. It has, it has to do with that's just one of the highways. You know how 
you know, this country has got Interstate 70, Interstate 40, Route 66, and other things like that. I think that that this particular, you know, 37th parallel or 37th degree latitude is more like a, just a very traveled highway. And then on it, you have, you know, Taos, New Mexico, the Aztec, New Mexico, Area 51, and just off of the Chaco Canyon, and, uh, you know, Mesa Verde, and a bunch of other places that are very spiritual to Indians. And then Dulce, New Mexico, which is an underground base there. So, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. There's uh, the one thing I did learn about that, the more I, I, I invested in, in, into researching that was the majority of aquifers in the United States, you can get to the majority of them on the 37th degree latitude. And for years now, um, I've been studying UFOs, balls of light that have been seen near water sources. Even with my animal mutilation investigations, there seems to be a water source nearby, either a pond or a stream or a creek or, you know, something like that. So water has something to do uh, with what's happening out there. And maybe that's why the 37th is the most popular because you can hit all the underground water sources. Obviously the, uh, the 37th parallel, correct me if I'm wrong, it runs over the, the, the spot of Hellier as well, does it not? Is it going over the Mammoth Cave System in, in West Virginia and, and Southern Ohio? Is that oh, it does. It goes over the, the cave system. There's a lot of caves. It goes through uh, Joplin, Missouri, the spook lights of Joplin, Missouri, and some other uh, Cape Girardeau, which was a, a, another um, uh, sighting or, or crash, basically, in Missouri. It just all falls in that. But there are a lot of caves uh, along that. And maybe that's because of the aquifers. You know, maybe that has, you know, I'm sure that has something to do with the underground aquifers and the caves. Um, oh, I, I kind of studied that area and there was caves in that area too where these things could probably come in and out of. But it would kind of make sense because, you know, um, if you already have an underground system, it'd be easier, you know, to use that underground system to, you know, for an underground facility, you know, if you have an underground cave. And then um, accessible to water too, as much water as you, you know, as you need, if that's the case, if that's what they need it. Now we do know there's a lot of sightings over the ocean. And uh, matter of fact, if you, uh, Christopher Columbus, you know, if you look at some of the old Christopher Columbus documents, he actually mentioned something uh, above the water coming out of the water to these lights. So, you know, was our, was that one of our first, uh, you know, UFO sightings by Christopher Columbus or, but I'm sure, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, sailors, you know, back in the day, it seemed a lot of that stuff. I mean, we didn't have very much light pollution, you know, back in the 14, 1500s. So um, I'm guessing there was a lot of stuff that they were seeing. Animal mutilations, I think one of the first animal mutilations that were documented here in the U.S. was, I think, 1896 in Missouri. And uh, that's where a, a, a family had seen a, a light in the sky, like a, like a saucer-shaped light in the sky. And it scared them so bad that, you know, they ran inside their, their house and, and, you know, the father took a gun and with him and he thought that was it. This was the end of the world. And when they, because they'd never seen anything like that in their life, they came out the next day and the father found three steers that were, that were laying dead where the light was and all three of them were void of blood. So animal mutilations, which is interesting, uh, it's not something new. It's been going on, you know, for centuries. Uh, I've had, uh, you know, uh, the pleasure of working with and, and speaking with a few of our Native Americans here in, in Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada regions, Four Corners, or Utah, too. And uh, they talk about, you know, stories of, of you know, travelers. It kind of, you know, when they talk about with their names, and it's, the name is different between Navajo and Apache and, and you, but it kind of translates to like star travelers or travelers from the skies or something, you know. Last year when I was filming um, Alien Highway in Utah, uh, we, were, we were shooting Outside of Skinwalker Ranch. Out of the eight episodes, seven of the episodes were actually my idea and from my investigations. The eighth episode, which was water, wasn't mine because I'm in Colorado and we shot that off of California. And so I was I was having the opportunity, the pleasure to speak with a, a Native American elder from the Ute tribe. And it was really interesting because I was when I was talking to him before you know, we, we were going to, you know, record him. 
and, and I was just having a casual conversation. I said, okay, you know, I understand, you know, because I also do some Bigfoot investigations that there's, that there's, you know, Sasquatch is a Native American name for Bigfoot. And he says, and I, and I apologize because I wasn't taking notes at the time because I was just talking with a guy. He says, well, you know, our name for Bigfoot is this. And he told me that. And I said, and then other, you know, uh, Native American tribes have, uh, you know, different names for UFOs. And he says, yeah, you know, ours is this. And he says, matter of fact, our ancestors have, you know, and their ancestors have seen, you know, these lights in the sky. And then, and I said, yeah, it's kind of crazy with the grays and stuff. You know, you wonder how long they've been, they've been around. And he goes, oh, you mean Barbara? And, and I'm going, you're telling me that you tribe has got a name for a gray alien? And he goes, oh yeah. And he goes, oh, I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there are certain things that they weren't supposed to talk about, but because we were talking in such a relaxed uh, environment, that it turns out that the U tribe has actually That's got right a, sure. a word for gray alien. Um, and it's not something new, it's been around for a while. Like Chaco Canyon, which is, you know, which is pretty much our Stonehenge, sort of, you know, but not as old. Um, it was designed, well, we really don't know, I guess, because they're still making decisions what Stonehenge is about, but, you know, it's the, like these astronomical sites or astronomy sites, or, you know, where where people gather and they they watch the stars, like the Mayans did. And, you know, they didn't have TVs back then, right? And they didn't have radio, so they sat outside, they watched the stars, and they were very, very good uh, watching the stars, and, and they were able to tell which ones, you know, were constellations and which ones were moving like planets and stuff. And, I mean, that goes back to the Mayans. So because of that, they could tell when, you know, there was something different. Now, um, I, I've seen some um, petroglyphs at, uh, at, I think it was just outside Chaco Canyon, where the, I don't, it's, uh, I mean, I can't remember, I apologize, I can't remember how many hundreds of years ago it was, but it was a supernova, and, and they spotted it, and then, you know, they, you know, they recorded this, the supernova, um, and it was next to a crescent moon, it was pretty cool, of the way, but, and then when, when scientists backtracked, what that was, they found out, oh yeah, it's the same time frame as you know when that super so we know that they were very in tune with the night sky, which also means they were very in tune to things that were flying around out there. Oh. Now UFOs aren't 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 new at all. Right. They've been around for centuries. Um, even Sasquatch, I mean the first time I saw a a Bigfoot footprint out here in Colorado, it, it blew my mind because you know, I'm very analytical. I design microchips for a living, so I do, so I address every one of my investigations analytically, and I try and eliminate all the possibilities before I look into you know the, the paranormal. And I'm looking at this footprint in the snow, and then I look up and I see that was a left footprint. Then I saw a right, and I saw a left, and then I measured them, and they were four feet from left to right, left to right, and they were coming down here, right. And, and, and I tried all, everything I, you know, tried to figure out what it could be other than something that, that these footprints were 18 to 20, it actually is 20, about 19, 20 inches, uh, probably a little bit bigger because they were in the snow. So that, that kind of got me started uh, researching Bigfoot. And then there's been a lot of UFO sightings around Bigfoot. And since then... You have I've a conclusion as, as to that? So just touching on what you briefly just said then in terms of the crossover with there being so such evidence such a wealth of evidence of crossover between ufo sightings and bigfoot mm -hmm. um as to what that tie-in is as to whether bigfoot for example is is a cryptozoological but zoological unknown um primate or whether he himself is extraterrestrial it's yeah there is a crossover and i've noticed that out not only with bigfoot but also with with ghosts because I do it's kind of where I start off doing UFOs and then once once I you know I had all my equipment and I've got tons of equipment um, I got involved in Bigfoot investigations and monsters and and then ghost investigations and stuff and then I started seeing it's kind of cool because if you go through all that then you start seeing commonalities through all of that um, I don't I'm not quite sure with Bigfoot you know I've heard both cases of being spiritual then even you know being alien but um, I can tell you from, if you look at it from maybe a science side, 
you know, that, uh, that this could be, um, you know, part of evolution and not part of us, but, you know, how we kind of split off. Um, you, know, you have a giant Pithecus, you know, and, um, and they just happen to be extremely intelligent. Now, um, I can tell you from, from a science side and even from an evolutionary side that the more we work with technology, you know, the less we're in tune with our environment, pretty much. And, you know, um, our, our, our eyes actually, and I read a study a few years ago, our eyes have a capability, and still some people still do have the capability of seeing infrared. And there was a study from, from some university that had, uh, um, they were showing flashes of light of infrared, and the eyes were reacting to the infrared light, but the brain wasn't. So over a period of evolutionary time, the brain had decided there's no reason for homo sapiens to be able to see UV or you know any type of ultraviolet light. So the brain kind of blocks that out. With, with Bigfoot, um, you know, because their environment is is not associated with technology, um, their eyes, which are very similar to ours, you know, with, you know, with cones and the rods, that they probably can see infrared, so they would be able to see the infrared flashes of, of, of uh, motion sensing game cameras, and, and their hearing hasn't been destroyed due to all loud traffic and the headphones and everything else. So, and um, you and I, we, you know, we do have a sixth sense. And, and for your listeners out there, everybody does. Uh, we, your women's sixth sense, we call it women's intuition. And for those that don't think that they do, if, if you ever sitting in a vehicle, or you're sitting somewhere, and you got a feeling that someone's staring at you, and they're not a part of your peripheral vision, you turn around and look and they are, how did you know that? How did you pick that up? So now you have, but, I would say now you have Bigfoot probably has the same thing. But over the years, because of technology and where you know Bigfoot lives in that environment, that's been enhanced. As as in our case, it, it hasn't been. So not only do you know they have good hearing and good eyes and, and, and actually that type of sixth sense that that they can sense it. Now, but they're very, very in tune to your environment. So I've learned over the years too that it could be energy sources, it could be something changing in their environment um, that takes them to like a UFO encounter. Uh, I do know that uh, electromagnetic fields that um, animals, certain animals are very sensitive to electromagnetic field. So if a craft comes in and you know there's a strong electromagnetic field, you know maybe Bigfoot can pick that up. I mean these are all just kind of speculations and theories. Yeah. Science um, develops quite, quite literally daily with our understanding of all sorts of abilities of animals that we, we appreciate that live in our world that we don't know. Things like echolocation, obviously, used by animals. That's a recent, relatively recent discovery. Um, I saw something that showed how certain birds see in ultraviolet. And if you were to look at one of them was a pigeon and one of them was a, a, a blue tit. There were, there were some birds with the colors of the plumage that me and you can see, and actually what that bird looks like under UV, and they had a completely different pattern. Some of them were spotted where their normal spectrum plumage isn't spotted, because actually what the, the birds are seeing is in a slightly different spectrum of light. That's a new understanding, and that's something that we didn't think animals did, because it's not what we do, and it takes extensive amounts of research and discovery to get to a point where we realize that there are people, these animals are operating on, on, on in different ways. I think it's a, it's a magnetite too that they have in their beaks. That's the, it's like a, you know, their own personal compass. And, you know, that's yeah. how they're able to uh, go back to whatever location they started off when they, when they flew south for the winter and were able to come back. Then you got the cases with, with the cases where there's dogs that, you know, they get they they leave an you know, they leave a vehicle when it's on vacation and they travel, you know, hundred miles back to their home. That just happened not too long ago. I think it was Missouri, uh, where the, the people moved and uh, the dog escaped and fifty miles 
<laughs> was able to find the you know the house that they moved from. But you're right. I mean, we're still trying to understand that, and uh, you know, we can look at that as paranormal. We know it's not because it's you know, sure. it happens all the time. So the stuff that's paranormal, people look at it going, well, I just that's just too far fetched. Well, is it? Because if, like you just said, if you look at the animals in our backyard, so to speak, you know, and you really don't understand a lot about them, then uh, you know, you think that's paranormal. I mean, how long did it take before? Um, Doctors could understand, or actually not doctors, but with adventurers, and he figured out that that uh, elephants, you know, went, you know, they went back to a graveyard. I mean, they didn't die when they knew they were dying. They would go to a graveyard because um, they couldn't find out, you know, a lot of elephant bones. And could that be the same case with uh, with Bigfoot? That you, know, I do know that they travel um, in pairs. Although there have been cases in Tennessee where there were some rogue ones, but they do travel in pairs. Um, they usually don't have a large family, maybe, you know, one or two offspring at the most. So they keep the families very small. And, and then they're part of a clan, just like Native Americans are. Maybe that's where Native Americans picked it up from. You know, so you have a very small family, then you have a clan. And my research in talking to different people, you know, every so many years, the clans meet. Now, maybe that's dependent now on technology, but, you know, and, and people in, intruding. Uh, on, on, you know, their, you know, where they live. But then again, too, you think we're crowding, uh, you know, the environment. But if you really look at it, if you take an airplane up <laughs> and you look down, uh, humans uh, have a tendency of uh, congregating together. But even in California, Southern California, when I fly back from Southern California, um, and I, there's just vast areas of open areas that people don't live because they were very, very social, right? So, and then, uh, and then, uh, and then you look at the oceans, right? And yeah. um, that's seventy percent of the Earth, and that's where um, you know recently you know, with the with the Pentagon uh, coming out here and, and basically stating that oh yeah you know we do have a uh, a program that you know we're tracking UFOs or at least we're investigating UFOs. Um, I've, I've known about that program probably for the past 15 years, but I didn't know it was the Pentagon. And I thought, it, I actually thought it was through the CIA um, because uh, MUFON, the headquarters of MUFON was here in, in, in Colorado and uh, James Carrion at the time was, uh, was the head of MUFON. And I think he was also former army intelligence. Well, there were some interesting things that I was working with MUFON out here um, helping the state director, and we we're helping with a MUFON, MUFON symposium. I came across some material that was telling me that uh, that organizations were involved in MUFON to learn more about sightings. Basically, if you have if you have an organization, a government organization out there that wants to stay stay somewhat quiet, silent, secluded. Uh, but still wants to do investigations, what better way of doing it than to infiltrate a place like MUFON and have people do all the investigations for you. <laughs> and then you have all the material. And then you don't, no, there's, there's really no budget because it's, it's all right there. Billions and billions and billions of dollars, pounds and euros are hidden away in the black budgets of our national governments, funding research and operations of topics not often discussed outside of GCHQ or the NSA. They research many wild ideas and put into effect practices that are possibly immoral or even illegal at the surface. None of their findings will ever make it onto this podcast, onto your radio, or your TV, or your newspapers. Not, of course, unless they wanted to. But the government, with their layers of secrecy, aren't the only ones with the funding and financial backing to properly investigate these things to develop technologies to push the boundaries of knowledge. Earth's richest tech giants are getting in on the game too. Mark Zuckerberg is involved with a Starshot project, dubbed the most ambitious alien finding project ever. Russian billionaire Yuri Milner is working on sending probes to Saturn's mysterious moon Enceladus in search of extraterrestrial life. 
Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are building their own spacecraft at a faster rate than any of our government projects. By all accounts, and on current evidence, it's the civilian money which will make the biggest or certainly the most publicly recognised developments as we step forward to our own uncertain futures. It was the hotel tycoon Robert Bigelow, founder of the now employee-less Bigelow Aerospace, who in 1995 founded the National Institute for Discovery Science, researching at great cost various paranormal and fringe topics, most notably the field of ufology. A year later he purchased the notorious Skinwalker Ranch from the Sherman family, widely recognised as possibly the most wide-ranging hotspot for weird happenings, touching all parts of the paranormal spectrum. His deputy administrator, Combe Kelleher, conducted most of the research before publishing the story with George Knapp in the landmark Hunt for the Skinwalker. Though, unlike the ranch's next owner, Brandon Fugel, most of the photographic and videographic evidence that Bigelow gathered was not publicly released. Some theorise... Some theorise that the reason for this was that the real puppet master of the sale and the investigation was not indeed Bigelow, but someone with much more power, likely with a governmental backing. So whilst these billionaires may have the funding and the resources, it's not always easy to sidestep those who may want them silenced. Well, at that time, uh, the billionaire Robert Bigelow uh, was starting the star team for MUFON. And, and uh, matter of fact, the very first investigation for MUFON star team was one of my investigations, which was an animal mutilation here in Colorado. But I had learned that the money wasn't coming from Bigelow, that, th that he was sort of like the money was coming through him through a government source. And this is just some things that I saw, some evidence and some, if you know, anyway, I won't go into it all, but so I had an idea that Bigelow, the money wasn't coming from Bigelow. Do you think that applies to his research into Skinwalker as well? That it maybe wasn't, he wasn't necessarily pulling all the well, strings there? Absolutely. But once Bigelow started, we started the Star Team program and, uh, and basically what Star Team program is, is you know, you have like these class three or class four investigations where, where craft left some type of evidence or an alien left some type of evidence. And that's what Bigelow was interested in. So, you know, the lights in the sky and, you know, and, and it's other things like that, that are, that have become very mundane over the years for us investigators. Those are like, you know, uh, those don't have real evidence, even though people have seen them, but I got no evidence to, to prove they actually saw them other than, you know, their, their eyewitness count. But, we were looking for hard evidence, and that's what the star team was. Well, so you would get um, a witness would, would send in uh, a sighting report that, that had hard evidence or maybe maybe could have been some evidence. And that was sent to Bigelow, and Bigelow would decide whether or not that was going to be a star team because or star investigation because he was funding the star team. And then they would come back a couple of days later and say, oh, yeah, um, yeah, go ahead and roll your star team to do an investigation. Well, after the first couple of months, some of us were starting to see that we were being jumped by another team by at least yeah. a day. And so what Bigelow was doing, he was purposely, he had his own investigators. So he would find out, you know, about these, these cool sightings. He would send his own team right out there and then by the time we came out, the witness would say, well, you guys are already here. Well, no, we weren't. Well, you were here the day before yesterday. No, we weren't. Well, it was Bigelow. And, and then I learned about that from other state directors through complaints of, of, of you know, their star investigators saying, hey, we were, our investigations were jumped. We didn't know by who. And then when I talked to these guys, going, yeah, it's Bigelow's doing it. And he's being funded by the government. And I know that for a fact, I just have no proof to show it. So it was kind of interesting that uh, uh, when the book came out, the 37th parallel, um, in, in the book, I talk about how, how you know, Bigel could be associated or not or whatever. And at the very end of the book, there's this kind of cryptic 
ending at the very end of the book. And I, I, I still get emails as this recent as last week, you know, why, why did it end like that? Well, because, you know, um, there were things going on that you just couldn't come right out and say, especially you're not going to, you know, tag a billionaire because I'm a hundred there, right? I have hundreds of dollars. <laughs> And I think we were we are getting at the time um, where, and we were kind of thinking disclosure because of, of the Nimitz and you know the Tic Tacs and and now the Pentagon even re, even more recently say yeah yeah you know we've got another program and we don't know what those Tic Tacs were and um, it makes you wonder if they do know what they are that you know, some people are saying well well they're they're military that's why they're you know they're saying they're trying to push it up. And it's and it's good reason they, for that. They turn around and said that it was a, a passenger plane off in the distance or something, and that the the well, numbers were, were wrong on it. Yeah, originally it didn't that's have what a they were saying. Though. Right, that, originally that's what they were saying, and then and then um, there's just, just a lot of smart people out here. So you know we're looking at the you know the we're all you and I you know we're looking at the, the video footage or we're, we're sitting down doing math or figuring out that we don't have the materials that that could stay in the, in that kind of a structure uh, for that amount of g-force at that amount of speed not only would the occupant inside just be dead but but the actual structure itself would collapse under that much g-force and we don't you know we don't do we, we well we don't know but the materials if we have materials or not because I mean, they could have materials on it but then there's also the case where the, the extreme speed, no sound, you know, no no exhaust, and so you know you get the I get the debunkers out there saying, well, well it's it's, a, it's our it's our technology, and I and, and I would say, well, wouldn't that make you mad that if we had a technology that defies gravity, that doesn't use petroleum-based products that are that are you know affecting our planet, wouldn't that make you mad that? that governments are holding that from us. I met this lady, it's really cool. Um, she's passed now, but uh, it was a few years ago and she's in Denver and she saw me on some show or something. And she emailed me and she says, I got a story for you. And I talked a little bit to her over the phone and then I went to, uh, to Denver and, and with my wife and we sat down and, and interviewed her. Such a, just a wonderful lady. So she was a little girl at the time and, and she was living outside of Roswell. They were living, it's, it's sort of like Ros, the, the, the Roswell and the El Capitan Mountains and she was on the other side of the El Capitan Mountains. And um, I forget the name of the ranch, but it's, it's the same ranch that like Billy the Kid started the Renegades. It was really cool. And she's in one of the houses, and then her uncle, her dad's brother, was living in John Tunstall's house. Uh, it was during the weekend of July 4th, 1947. She later found this out from her, her, her uncle. Um, her uncle had seen a glow off at a distance from his house, the Tunstall house, and, and thought, oh, you know, it's another range fire because that happens out there. And then a couple of days later after that, He's the uh, this military convoy came down their ranch road, which is not a county road; it's a private road, and and they were in jeeps and and uh, you know have track trucks and stuff, and they were MPs with guns, and they were forcing everybody to go back in their house and get off the streets, and she was she was a little kid at the time, and this was just traumatic for her because you know we just got out of World War II, and now what the hell's going on now? And so they were all afraid. And, and anyway, so the convoy went past John Tunstall's house about a mile or so down the road and retrieved whatever they needed to retrieve. So when you start putting all this information together with all these witnesses, um, I can tell you 100% that, that, that there was a crash there. And what they saw, they perceived as aliens based on, you know, that there were eyewitness testimonies that these guys were, you know, four feet tall or so roughly. And they even talked about Glenn Dennis having to order child-sized coffins for these things. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. And so once you get involved in that and you're realizing that 
oh my gosh, you know, uh, these stories are true and there's more to this. And, and as an investigator, that puts you on a path where, okay, now I've got to see if I can find the evidence. And it's not so much, um, it's not that I can, I'm conceited, but, you, but if you do something, you've got to do something for yourself. Because if you do it for other people, you'll never satisfy yourself. That's one of the reasons why other investigators out there that have written books, I don't, uh, I may use their books as a reference, but I don't tend, uh, tend to read them because um, I've done enough research on my own that I don't want to go off track, to go in a different direction. Now, I have tried other things other investigators have said, um, especially on animal mutilations, looking for micrometeorites and some other things. I've, I've never found any of that. But I'm one of the first investigators that actually uses an EMF meter, and I found some high electromagnetic fields in a couple of places um, on the ground and then uh, actually on an animal itself. So I do know there was an energy source that, that's responsible for that animal's death. I have enough proof of that. So. See, if you just picture, uh, picture a hole in an animal, and then what you do is you look at the edge of a hole and you cut a little two-sided triangle from that hole because you want, you want that edge of the hole to, or the lab to see what made that hole. So that's what I was doing. So I had these little, you know, triangle pieces. And um, all the cases I've taken to them, there was never signs of hemorrhaging, which means the animal didn't die bleeding out, right? Or else it show hemorrhaging. Um, there was no signs of, of cauterization, meaning a hot laser. So for people out there listening to this saying, well, they're using lasers. No, they're not using hot lasers. Could be using a cold laser. I don't know about cold lasers but they're not using, there's, not, there's nothing cauterized. Most of my cuts were very, very smooth, like a scalpel. And then there were a couple of times where they were serrated. It's really hard when you do animal mutilation investigations, you gotta get there within 24 to 32 hours. After that, the environment starts destroying your evidence. And there was one case with a rancher that I did a few mutilation investigations for that he found a calf that morning called me and by that afternoon I was there I just left work <laughs> I packed my stuff in my truck and, and off I went and two and a half hours later I was at his ranch we picked up we picked the animal up well we looked checked the side out and everything and then I put the animal in the back of my truck that's why I drive a truck because you really don't want to put a, a dead animal in the back of your car or SUV I have an SUV and I, I was putting dead animal parts in the back and my wife got mad at me so and it was about 12.30 at you know, midnight you know, where I finally got there and dropped off this animal. And, um, and when they opened it up in the, car, in the, in the crop seat, the animal had, the, the tongue had been cut out from the very back of its throat. There was probably about a six, seven inch hole um, in the anal area and, the, and then it was born of blood. So when they opened it up, um, the next day I talked with the, the vet, you know, the vet, the lab veterinarian, and I didn't want to ask him any questions that would salt the investigation. You know, I, I used to be, you know, a volunteer cop, so I've learned how you interview people. You don't, you don't, you know, give them, in, you know, if you give wrong information, leading the witness, all that. So, you know, basically, what did you find? Did you find anything unusual? Can you explain what you found? He said, well, the majority of the organs were, were taken out, but they looked like they were cut out. And the only way he could figure they were cut out, they were cut out and they were pulled out through the anal area. And I said, what was left? He says, well, there was a one lung and there was the heart. And I said, what did the heart look like? And he says, well, the heart was collapsed. I'm going, oh, okay, that tells me it was bled out. And then I said, anything else unusual in the, in, in the digestive tract? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, the tongue was gone. And then he explained all that. If I would have got on someone else's path, like maybe Christopher O'Brien's or Linda Moulton House or something, um, I may not have been able to find that. So it's, it's once you get on your own path and you start thinking creatively, you know, on your own and, and what, what instruments can I use that, that other people haven't used. Um, I'm also the first person that uses uh, a, a, a full spectrum camera on animal mutilations. So I shoot IR and UV during the daytime. And most people will go, well, how do you do that? You can only see it at night. Well, no, 
because what you do is you buy a white light filter on your camera and you block out all the white light and then you shoot it during the daytime. That's simple. No one else ever did it. I'm not saying I'm a genius for figuring it out. I'm just saying, oh, you know, I have this camera that shoots night vision. Look, it's got some threads on it. I bet you I could probably put a white light filter on it and shoot night vision during the daytime looking for evidence that our eyes can't see. I haven't found any yet, but, you know, um, that's just one of those other things that, uh, uh, you know, that I use. I, I use other things too, uh, you know, to try and to try and find evidence. Now, as as a former law enforcement, I know people don't like a lot of, a lot of law enforcement people right now in in the U.S. <laughs> I don't know about other countries, but if it makes them feel better. They fired me, so <laughs> I have learned that every crime and animal mutilation is a crime. Yeah. Every crime that occurs, evidence is, is left. The issue is, is we don't know what the evidence is and how to find it. So now you have to be very creative and trying to figure out how to find evidence that you know is there, but you don't know how to find it. <laughs> so I've had people email me telling me that I got more evidence on, in my one Skinwalker Ranch episode that we weren't even on the Skinwalker Ranch than they've had the whole season so far. And that's just based on, on people emailing me because of some phenomenal stuff. But the thing is, is uh, I, I don't know. I think some of this stuff is also, you know, uh, exaggerated for TV too. I was but, so excited to see in when I heard that they were allowing cameras in and they were going to start running investigations and that they had scientists and biologists and they were going to film it all. I was so excited. I'd never yeah, seen any live footage from inside. Obviously, you know, you see um, stills and all the accounts from the Shermans and then obviously Bigelow took it and it all went quiet because it was obviously government funded. And then there was this quiet takeover where he'd sold it to somebody else and nobody quite knew who, and maybe you did inside the circle, but you know, I, I and then all of a sudden they let cameras in and I was so excited. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a big letdown. I mean, there was some interesting evidence, of course, you know, the lights you know, on the TV and stuff, you know, that's, it's interesting phenomena, but yeah, it was a letdown. It's, um, yeah, one of the rumors is I want to make it into like an amusement park. Now, you know, not amusement, a tourist trap, a tourist attraction, not amusement park, but a tourist attraction. That's that's one of the rumors that we got from the locals there, depending on some of the people involved in purchasing the ranch and what the background was. So I'm hoping that's not the case. Um, the other one was obvious that they wanted to make a TV show from it. But... Whatever the case was, Bigelow, I think, bought it for like 265000 something like that. He sold it, sold it for $4.2 million. So there, there, there is stuff going on. But when you, when you talk to the Native Americans there, and then I talked to, uh, you know, we interviewed a tracker. Um, and he, you know, his, his interview got cut too. But um, you don't have to be on a ranch. Far from it. We were four or five miles away from the ranch. And there's stuff going on everywhere. Bigfoot sightings, UFO sightings, you know, skinwalkers, actual skinwalker sighting, alien creatures, all kinds of stuff. I design microchips. That's how I make money. And then my extra money I, do, I, I use for my investigations. So I don't need to make money on my website. I just put the information out there openly to the public. And then I say, look, guys, this is what I found. It's up to you to decide whether or not you agree with me or disagree with me because, you know, that's, that's what I need. And then also your comments. And I do take a lot of comments. I get a lot of emails. I said, let me know what you think because I don't know everything. And for an investigator to say, yeah, I know it all, don't listen to that guy. He doesn't know anything. So I'd like to thank you. Okay. Uh, well, I, so I mean, much for coming on. Um, your listeners, if, if they want any more information, they go to my website, ufonut.com. Or you know, or just look up my name on your, you know, I'm everywhere, and I'll try and answer. I, I do answer every one of my emails. But thank you very much for having me on your podcast. Once I appreciate again, it. it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Hey, you know, we can do a second one down the road. <laughs> Amazing, perfect. Well, I have plenty more to uh, to talk to you about. So thanks so okay. much. Thank you. Thank you, so you very much. much. Peer Beyond the Veil has been written and presented by myself, Mark Watson. Music and soundtracks are credited and licensed to Purple Planet and to Kevin MacLeod, licensed under Creative Commons. 
All rights are reserved by our parent company, MLW Publishing. You can follow us at facebook.com forward slash peer beyond the veil or on Twitter at peer beyond the veil or at peer beyond 2020. Please click the like and subscribe buttons when you see them, most importantly, wherever you listen to your podcasts. It helps us to attract the attention we need to keep the show going, to get the guests that you all want to hear from, and to help more and more people peer beyond the veil.